Porto Brianna Garcia from Tambu. And uh, Brianna will us basically talk about um, industrial IoT systems, uh, remote monitoring in the scope of digital transformation. Brianna, would you like to take it from here? Um, yes, thank you, Kevin, and hello, everybody logging in. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. And we'll jump into the Internet of Things. Looks great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so as mentioned, I am with an industrial Internet of Things software company here in New York City. And we basically specialize in smart connected systems and how anybody, despite any educational and or economic background, can essentially tap into this a uh, wonderful wave of Internet of Things connected systems for their own use. So we're going to be discussing um, digital transformations in the lens of manufacturing for what people would usually term as industry point zero. This is usually a hot ticket word, but it basically refers to the concept of factories in which machines and are augmented with wireless connectivity and sensors um, connected to a system that can essentially visualize the entire production line, control, and make decisions on its own. So what makes in Industry 4.0 efforts so hard? Well, these industrial innovation projects are difficult to put in place um, for many reasons, which we'll get into, but typically the technology isn't the actual hurdle. It's ultimately um, what kind of funds these projects and who is able to essentially lead these projects because there's a lot of collaboration for many different stakeholders, either inside the organization or outside. Um, and it's not always clear who's in charge and how these things should be paid for. So these are just some reasons why Industry 4.0 is difficult, but um, we'll get into how we can kind of get over those things. So we'll just jump into it. Um, how can we make innovation projects faster, cheaper, and more accessible? Well, at Tembu, uh, we help make these projects happen not only through the lens of our software and technology, but also through how we can approach and how we think about these projects. So I'll show you how we're actually making this industry 4.0. Again, this is encompassing the digital transformation to achieve uh, connected sensors and systems with the Internet of Things through basically our platform called Cosmos. Um, Cosmos is, well, here's an image of our Cosmos on a desktop, on a tablet, and on your cell phone. So the old platform, again, ultimate goal of the world is to democratize the Internet of Things. And basically what we've created is an application that allows you to create an IoT system in minutes with no coding whatsoever. Um, I am not an engineer and I can set up an entire connected system within about 30 minutes. And we do it quite often here in New York and around the world, which we'll get into in a little bit. But we've essentially designed Cosmos this way um, because it's very advantageous for different businesses to work with their existing assets um, to kind of solve hard problems and use Cosmos or the Internet of Things to essentially start to track and monitor, remotely monitor and predict when things will happen. So basically we've done, is, um, we've specialized in acquiring data from the physical world. We make data accessibility um, easier through the browser that you see on the screen. And we also give you the power to have alerts triggered based on application specific logic. So if you, for example, want to be notified or have an alarm set when a machine is exceeding a temperature, which you know it will mean such in, you can set those results in or alerts in the application itself and you can be notified immediately. And as Kevin alluded to earlier, we also specialize in machine learning for predictive maintenance. And We'll get into this in a little bit, but basically what we do is we collect enough data, um, which is usually about 100,000 data points from a couple of different variables, and we can start to figure out with the machine learning algorithm any anomalies, um, irregular patterns, something that might indicate, okay, this machine based on the past three months is going to break in four weeks, and now you're starting to get insight as to, okay, great, I can figure out what piece needs to be purchased and start to figure out time and um, subcontractor schedules to essentially get this item fixed before it actually goes down. So there are a couple ways that we can essentially collect data from the physical world. One is through environmental sensors. So these sensors can be anything from temperature and humidity sensors that are either placed in refrigerators and or freezers. Um, we could also use sensing sensors on existing infrastructure. 
So we can also use AC current sensors if you want to look at, let's say, HVAC systems, or if you want to figure out the temperature and vibration of a machine and our motor, you can also use those sensors um, on assets and some. And then you can also access machines' existing um, sensor data. And this is usually in the form of programmable logic controllers, which we'll get into in just a moment, and or scatter systems. So if you are a machine-to-machine -machine environment and or already have a system in place, that data is already being logged and stored somewhere. What we can do um, through our API stations is essentially extract the information, run some sort of analysis, and then provide it back to you on the Cosmos platform or send it back to you on your existing platforms. Brianna, are you with us? Hello? Okay, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Welcome back. Please. Okay. Looks good. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm not sure I lost you, but we can collect physical data um, from environmental sensors, sensors that are go on existing assets like programmable logic controllers, or getting data from existing platforms such as SCADA systems and or um, already stored information from within a factory of some sort. So as mentioned, we are an internet-based software company, and we are hardware agnostic, which means we really don't care what kind of piece of machine you have on the floor. As long as it's functioning, there's a good chance that we will be able to work with it. And so this is a great way to bring more people into the picture and essentially reduce the barrier of entry of using this new technology. And again, we've designed this because it's, it's more flexibility. So there are a lot of companies that actually build the hardware and software components together. And it's good for ease of use, but it's really bad flexibility and for working with people um, that don't know, do not necessarily have the engineering skills to tap into this hardware software component. So we aim to bring the fully integrated user experience to a wide range of hardware devices, which is what you see right here. So as mentioned, um, programmable logic controllers are usually on manufacturing floors. They're using a variety of different um, use cases a lot of utilities, um, food manufacturing, aviation, et cetera, all have these PLCs or for the gamma watch controllers. We also support off-the-shelf environmental sensors. So as you see under COTS, um, we have temperature and humidity sensors and AC current sensors. These sensors are phenomenal if you just want to collect information without having to actually kind of get into the nitty gritty aspects of uh, the PLC or programmable logic controllers. And these off the shelf functions essentially come off five to seven years off batteries, depending on how many frequency um, data uploads they book. And then we also support Bluetooth. So the same way people have the AirBuds and or Bluetooth um, headphones, it's, it's the same exact communication protocol. And we also support smart switches, um, which are your remote control features. And then lastly, we support these microcontrollers, which are also these chips that go basically inside everything. They're small, low cost, and are usually connected via Bluetooth and or Wi-Fi, um, and are really great for using um, smart building or nerve smart connected projects. So this is just an overview of some of the hardware that we do support. Um, again, this is so that we can work with people who already have assets on the ground, and we're not trying to essentially have any upfront capital be spent, but to really leverage the existing assets that, that are there. Um, as mentioned, that PLC is a really great way that we can get information um, from machines. And ultimately, the idea is that we can use the data to better control and automate systems, be it smart lights, um, smart controls, et cetera. And so I've just provided here a brief overview of how it easy it is to set up systems. Um, this is it's just a five-step process. If you wanted to connect a PLC to Cosmos itself, 
Again, the whole setup process is usually under an hour. I can do it in about 30 minutes because I've done it a few times, but what we really, again, strive to do is democratize it. So if you've got the information, we can essentially help you just input it into the software upload itself. And you can have your Smart Connected product giving you detailed information in minutes, which is really what we're after. Um, and as mentioned is that predictive maintenance. So this just is an, uh, a graph that we have about turbidity. Um, turbidity is usually used as a marker for water quality parameters in a utility that is using a PLC. So this is just something to say that like we've taken data over a certain period of time and through our machine learning algorithms, we're able to say that in the future, we can determine that in this case, turbidity is going to be exceeding, um, what is it, like 70 NTUs, um, which is a bad threshold, essentially, and be notified or have the on-site managers notified in advance so they can fix the issue. The same exact idea and premise can be used for manufacturing. If you want to know when a machine is going to go down four weeks in advance, this is what one of the graphs might look like. Um, so now that we've essentially covered the different aspects of, of the flexibility of the Cosmos platform with regards to supporting various different types of hardware and a little bit about the actual data piece, um, I kind of wanted to go over just the architecture of the Internet of Things, but in the real world. So as mentioned, we have different sensors or machines or SCADA systems um, that we can collect information from. In this case, I put just a PLC because it's most used in manufacturing settings. That PLC sends information to what we call the gateway. The gateway is a great device. Um, it essentially collects all data from the PLC and then it enables essentially some analysis to be done here at the Cosmos Gateway. It also is great for offline data storage. So if the internet is ever lost, um, all that data from the machine will be sent and just sit actually physically on this gateway and then uploaded to the dashboard or in our cloud uh, once the internet is reestablished. So you never actually lose information. And then also these Cosmos gateways are great because they're about $35 to $45. They have a high computing power and they're about two by two inches um, in dimension, so they're very small. You can essentially put them anywhere. And then again, um, once the information is collected on the gateway, it then gets sent to Cosmos and or the dashboard that you see. So this is just the overall IoT architecture. There are different types of architectures, but this is the one that we have designed. Um, it gives us the most flexibility, allows us to essentially support the most amount of hardware. And what we have what we call over the air update, we can essentially push any new features out to the gateway and the gateway sends it out to the, the PLC itself. So we've got communication going both ways, um, again, adapted for innovations that are bound to come um, when we, we innovate our system, essentially. So I am going to talk about quickly just two quick use cases just to show the breadth of some of the work um, that we're doing in the manufacturing sector. So again, the big thing is interoperability, controlling and owning your own data and hardware. So innovating um, this industrial equipment, uh, we're doing this in the sense of we're looking at water pumps and we're looking at elevator usage in a huge manufacturing facility. Um, I do want to emphasize that we do not own your data. Uh, we don't use your data and we don't take it or market it to end users. Your data is yours and yours only. Um, there are various ways you can export it and send it to your systems, but the data is yours, and that's, that's something that we did emphasize. Um, all right, let's get into it. So this is a water pump. Uh, it essentially is located in a 100-year-old building. It's an old manufacturing building complex with six and it walls that essentially block any communication. Um, so we had to get creative on this one and think about what's the best way we can tap into this programmable logic controller or the PLC um, to essentially extract the information. And we've, we've essentially done this by plugging into the existing data ports and then transmitting the information over a sub one gigahertz radio to our gateways. Now we use a sub one gigahertz radio because it can go through the thick cement walls. 
other communication uh, methods like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth would never make it. So we had to get creative again and, and really figure out what tools we had in our toolbox and were able to essentially get this information from the water pump without asking or not having the building managers and our on-site managers add any new capital, which is fantastic. Um, and then we're also looking at, again, in this 100 million or this huge manufacturing building, this elevator usage. So in case we can't collect data directly from their control systems, we're actually adding simple voltage sensors to the elevator floor display panels to read the floor location information. And the reason why we're doing this is because the way that this manufacturing facility is set up is that they charge how many people, sorry, they charge the tenants based on how many people visit their floor. So this is another good way to get not only consumer behavior, but also it's, it's useful for the actual building manufacturers um, to know, you know what the price is going to be. And overall, um, we're able to figure out if the machine in our elevator was going to be malfunctioning anytime soon. So basically what we've done is, you know, this data acquisition, again, we're using voltage sensors on elevator display panels, and we're connecting to the PLC um, through Modbus integration with the water pumps. We're, when it comes to connectivity, um, we're tested a few different ways, but in the basement, because again, the thick cement walls, but we landed on using a sub one gigahertz radio in the basement to relate the data to the internet, which is then connected to the gateway. Um, and then we also looked at cost. So we coordinated with the, the telecom communication to install a cost-effective and shared internet connection and we relied on existing operational equipment rather than fully integrating and or replacing um, the actual water pumps and elevator usage, which again makes us more flexible and, and being cost cautious when we're working with somebody else. Um, and then the maintenance aspect of it. So the operations of the existing equipment doesn't change um, while we're actually looking at the data itself. Um, once we do have enough information, again, we'll be losing that machine, machine learning algorithm to essentially identify this predictive uh, failure. Yeah. Um, I'm getting some feedback. Ooh, someone has their microphone on. Um, that's okay. I'm just gonna. I'll take two more minutes and just go through one last case study if that okay. works. Yeah. Sounds good. So lastly, working with a, a okay, um, great. So we're working with a major shoe manufacturer in India and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're looking. We're working at 14 facilities. This shoe manufacturer is called Mangini. They make 20,000 cakes per day. They're also delicious and amazing. And really, what we want to emphasize here is that. We started working um, with a single engineer who wanted to innovate their system without having to replace anything. And so what we've done is essentially attach voltage sensors to the log alarms in the food scanning system. So anytime anything goes wrong, that alarm goes off, it then is logged in Cosmos and they're able to not only have the records for their iOS compliance um, record keeping, but they're also able to be notified and to be able to set rules, et cetera. And then we're also using proximity sensors and temperature sensors in our cold supplies, which is basically their freezers and refrigerators to make sure that all of their food is the temperature that it should be, especially if you're consuming it. Um, so that's what we've done with Mongini's. Again, it's, it was one person who really wanted to innovate their system. And because of us being hardware agnostic, because we designed the software with the end user in mind, he is able to do it without us having to be there. And he has complete control over the data and he's, he's just phenomenal. But he's able to essentially start at one facility and then roll it out to the remaining 13 facilities. So again, um, just a recap, the voltage sensors we put on to existing um, quality control systems on the production line, these environmental sensors installed and existing refrigerators and freezers. Um, for connectivity, we're actually using the Ethernet connections. For the cost, we relied on existing operational equipment rather than fully replacing it. Um, the maintenance aspect, um, since the plant engineer is already running the equipment, 
you already have the updates and shelf, but he was able to resolve and control all of the issues. Um, occasionally, he needed a phone call or email support from us, but otherwise, he did it all himself. And then this plant engineer has also gained new skills, which ultimately landed him a new job where he's um, now in charge of upgrading facilities without having to replace or purchase any new equipment um, through Internet of Things technology. Um, and then again, um, Blair, yep. so uh, yep. uh, I think we have also some questions. I'm also getting some questions on your site. Um, so maybe uh, during the Q&A session, we can continue uh, on, on your subject as well. Uh, with the questions that I am receiving in the in the private private box, if that's okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so do you want me to just quickly wrap up? Yes, please go ahead. Perfect. Um, so just last two slides, and I can send you this information if you'd like later. But just helpful questions to ask when you're implementing an Internet of Things solution in your factory and or uh, manufacturing setting, I should say. These are some questions. Just be very pointed about what you want to monitor, the information you want to acquire, your sensing range, how often you want to view the data, um, what is your internet connection, your power source, and is your equipment indoors or outdoors? These are questions that we always ask people that we're working with, because again, we like to start small. The idea is that you start small on something that's very um, specific. And then lastly is, also, just keep in mind what kind of data do you need? Do you need live data? Do you need historical data for record or compliance keeping? Do you want analytical for learning and assessing? And then again, that last bit is going to be that predictive maintenance, which is what we're doing with um, that water tank monitoring in the old manufacturing building and elevator monitoring. Um, and then data for change. The idea would be to have the data actually influence some sort of policy change to essentially make manufacturing in this case um, more accessible so that would be the, the ultimate goal but anyways I'll wrap up there there's a lot to cover but I'm happy to discuss anything further and there's my email and just some of the places that we work around the world thank you thank you Brianna uh, 